Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about really fascinating research that may have identified yet another really interesting clue for why our planet is habitable and why it was able to sustain conditions necessary for life to thrive and evolve here for billions of years. The research that also to some extent suggests that our planet might be a lot more rare than we originally thought but also identifies some really important clues for how we could potentially find similar planets somewhere out there. So let's talk a little bit more about this because this was honestly really exciting. And the main premise in this research paper is to try to identify what exactly is responsible for allowing our planet to have such a strong magnetosphere for such a long time. Today there is really no doubt that the magnetosphere of planet Earth is one of the main reasons why life was able to survive and thrive here for an extremely long time. But the exact mechanism behind the magnetosphere creation and behind its, I guess, maintenance is still a little bit tricky to pinpoint. We're not entirely sure how it actually works. But we do have a pretty good idea of what powers it. In other words, where the energy for magnetosphere comes from. So in other words, we kind of have a pretty good idea of what the source of this energy is which is something that could be creating magnetospheres on other planets and something that planets like Mars seem to lack. We refer to this idea as Earth's dynamo theory, the churning and twisting of the internal parts of our planet that essentially generate the magnetic lines which then generate the magnetosphere. And although all of this motion is extremely complex and this is kind of what we're trying to understand, we do know that this motion is essentially caused by the radioactive decay of various heavy elements with mostly uranium and thorium being responsible for most of the heat provided. And all of this extra heat also generates a lot of other effects such as plate tectonics and essentially creates just the right balance for our planet to be able to maintain stable magnetosphere and also stable atmosphere, all of which results from just the right proportions of these materials inside the planet. And we know that, for example, if you were to look at our moon, you would see these dark mare, the very dark formations that are quite visible from anywhere on the planet. These were also formed as a result of a sudden heating event that was caused by the excess of radioactive materials in just one location on the moon. So in other words, these materials are extremely important for the maintenance of our planet, which means that it's kind of important for us to understand how much of, for example, uranium and thorium should be present inside the planet for the planet to become habitable like planet Earth. Because, as you can probably imagine, we expect different planets to have different composition on the inside, and we also expect planets to have completely different temperature and, of course, different internal structure based, of course, on what the original planetary system contained. And so what the scientists in this paper decided to do is use supercomputers and create simulations by essentially controlling the amount of thorium and uranium present inside of these hypothetical planets just to see what kind of an effect it would have on the internal and the external structure of the planet. In other words, they essentially modified different versions of planet Earth. Some had less uranium and thorium, some had a lot more uranium and thorium, and they just wanted to see what would happen to these hypothetical planet Earths depending on what's inside of them. And so first, what happens if there is more thorium and more uranium? Well, it turns out that unfortunately the planet becomes inhospitable, not because it becomes too hot, but because the internal structure changes to the point where most of the thorium and uranium ends up inside the mantle and creates a kind of an insulator that prevents the core from cooling down and from creating these dynamo motions that are essentially responsible for the magnetosphere. In other words, by being extremely hot, the planet automatically stops having the magnetosphere. At the same time, the volcanic eruptions become a lot more prominent and also end up releasing a lot more gas into the atmosphere, essentially creating super hot conditions no different from what you would find on the surface of Venus. Now, we don't really know if this is what happened to Venus and we don't really know if this is why Venus is like that, but there is a chance that maybe it was actually due to the differences in various uh, radioactive isotopes. At the moment though, unless we study the internal structure of Venus in more detail, we're not really going to know. And then on the opposite side, if the planet did not have enough radioisotopes and did not have enough thorium and uranium on the inside, it ended up as being a geologically inactive or technically geologically dead planet because it didn't have any magnetosphere and it didn't really have that much volcanism either. 
And in this case, this is quite possible what happened to Mars. It didn't really have enough mass, it didn't really have enough um, isotopes, and eventually its core solidified and stopped producing heat. The magnetosphere of Mars shut down, the atmosphere and the water were stripped, and eventually it turned into the desert world that it currently is. In other words, it looks like our planet was able to avoid becoming these unusual, strange and inhospitable worlds by having just the right amount of thorium, uranium and other heavy elements that provided just the right balance for Earth to become what it is today. Which of course means that our search for habitable worlds out there now has to also involve the idea of the internal structure and somehow identifying how much of the different radioisotopes could be present in one planet or another. Planets that are too hot internally are not going to be a good place for us, and planets that are too cold are not going to be good either. But how can we possibly do this? How could we find out how much of thorium and uranium there is inside a planet if we actually don't even know how much there is inside planet Earth? Well, the scientists in the paper do actually discuss a very interesting proposition on how we could potentially identify the amount of thorium and, of course, uranium present in a certain star system and thus use this to try to identify if any of the planets have the right amounts. We can actually detect what's known as europium. Europium is a type of a rare earth element that essentially is produced in a very similar way to thorium and uranium. It's produced during the so-called R process. Our process, where R stands for rapid, is essentially an extremely, extremely energetic event, usually occurring when neutron stars collide, that suddenly bombards various elements with a lot of neutrons, which essentially results in the production of different heavy elements. In this periodic table, you can see that a lot of elements, especially the ones in violet, are essentially produced only during the merging neutron star events with some elements being produced during powerful supernova and some elements being produced during other powerful events. But the neutron star collision and the resulting explosion from these collisions is essentially how we believe a lot of the uranium and thorium on planet Earth came to be. These extremely powerful kilonova events are so fast and so extremely energetic that essentially the materials inside of them produce these very difficult to find elements with one such element being europium. And it just so happens that by looking at different stars, we can normally measure the amount of europium present in the spectra of these stars. And by then comparing this to the spectra inside our sun, we can kind of estimate how much potential thorium and uranium could be present in some of the terrestrial planets in this particular star system. And in the past, we've been able to identify stars that have a lot of europium, a lot more than our own solar system, and we also found stars that have a lot less. So in that sense, it does seem to be like an effective way for us to discover if some of these planets could potentially have just the right conditions for magnetosphere and for essentially habitable terrestrial planet in the star system. But for now, what this study presents is yet another really important measurement for habitability of various terrestrial planets. By being able to measure the magnetosphere of a distant planet and by also being able to establish if the magnetosphere is just the right kind and if the planet has just enough heat to maintain this magnetosphere for a very long time, we can thus find yet another exoplanet potentially similar to planet Earth. And so in that sense, this is a pretty exciting study. But you can learn more about this in the article in the description below. And as always, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. Once we discover more about habitable planets, or once we discover something else about the magnetosphere, or how it's generated, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon, or by buying the Wonderful Person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.